listening to Setting History Straight with Linda Watson. Tonight we're covering the American Indians. Yay, we've been working our way through history and we've gone through the period of the Dark Ages. I, uh, there's going to be times that we go back and catch some other pieces. But today we're going to jump in and we're going to start talking about the American Indian. And I'm going to start by asking, why do we even study all the history? And sometimes we just need to go back and review and ask ourselves, why is it important to study history? And in Deuteronomy 32, 7 says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Ask your elders and they will tell you. So we're commanded to study the generations, the many generations. It says, consider the years of the many generations. Remember the days of old. Because there's things we can learn from them. And they made a lot of sacrifices in their lives for us. And so that's one another reason we do that. But when, as we un understand about the American Indians, we're going to find out it's not the same picture that we've been told. And so we want to cover who these people are and where they came from. Now, we, we're going to start talking about Carthage. And Carthage is located, it's a seaport located in the Mediterranean Sea, closer to the land of Israel. Uh, it did not allow the passage of Roman and Greek ships through the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there was a blockade there, and they did not allow that, allow passage. And the people in those areas, especially the Romans and Greeks, were afraid to go out because they believed that the earth was flat and they were told that if they went off too far, they would fall off the earth. So that's one of the reasons why they didn't pursue it to start with. But they were landlocked. Now, there was a tribe called Gad, which was one of the 12 tribes that lived in that area, and they named the gates of Gibraltar after themselves. At that time, it was they were called the Pillars of Hercules. Um, but basically, that traffic was controlled by the tribe of Gad and the tribe, probably the tribe of Simeon. The people at that time actually did know about America. And I'm going to read you some quotes from some historians. And they didn't know America by the name. They just knew it was out there. Now, the first one is Aristotle. We're all familiar with Aristotle, and this is what Aristotle wrote. In the sea outside the Pillars of Hercules, they say there's an island found by the Carthaginians, a wilderness having woods of all kinds, navigable rivers, remarkable for various kinds of fruits, and many days sail distance away when the Carthaginians who were the masters of the Western Ocean, observed that, that many traders and others, attracted by the fertile soil and the pleasant climate, they feared the knowledge of the land would reach other nations. Therefore, the Carthage Empire, Carthaginian Empire, issued a decree that no one under penalty of death should therefore sail thereof. So that is Aristotle talking about America. Now, here's another one. Diodorus, the Greek historian, says, Over against Africa lies a very great island in the vast ocean. Many days sail from Libyan western side. The soil there is very fruitful. A great part thereof is mountains. And, but much likewise is a plain, which is most sweet and pleasant part, for it is watered with several navigable rivers. So they were both talking about America. They had heard about the land, but they were not familiar with it. Nobody had actually gone there except the Phoenicians and the people of Carthage. And we're going to find out what part in history the Middle East played in this. Now, we know, I'm just going to give you a brief history of Carthage. The first ruler was a woman. Her name was Dildo. 
She is written about in the book of Aeneas. The uh, Latin poet uh, Virgil wrote the book Aeneas, and Josephus also described her as blonde and beautiful, and that she was the very first ruler of Carthage. And we also know that, jumping into our subject here, that Stabo, speaking of Moses, it says Moses' successors, this is what Stabo wrote, now he's a famous geographer, Moses' successors, the Israelites, seized the property of others and subdued most of Syria and Phoenicia. Now, Phoenicia is really that coastal area where Tyre and Sidon set. And we, if you've heard some of my programs before, and you read Amos 1, verse 6, and Amos 1, verse 9, you find out that who lived in Tyre, and that was the Edomites. That was Esau's descendants lived in Tyre. And so that would make King Herod probably, it's hard to know, but it would probably make King Herod a Edomite or a descendant of Esau. Now, we're going to talk about the relationship of the Israelites to that area. So I want to read here uh, about King David doing a census. Second Samuel 20 and 7. The point is here is that King David was taking a census. You know that this was a situation where he wasn't supposed to take the census. And we're not going to get into that part of the story, but he took a census, and I want to zero in on verse 7, the Second Samuel 24, verse 7. I want to zero in on it. It says, And came to the stronghold of Tyre, and all the cities of the Hevites and the Canaanites, and so he's talking about taking this census, and he's telling you that he went in, the people went into the cities where the Canaanites lived and the Hevites lived in the land of Tyre to count the Israelites. So I don't know if, if people are understanding what I'm saying. That's telling you that the Israelites were mixed in, in the, and they lived in the land of the Phoenicians, and they lived in Tyre. No other way around it. He sent the people to take a census. They went to Tyre to take the census, and they took census among the Hevites and the Canaanites. He did, in the cities of the Hevites and Canaanites. So that's where some of the Israelites were living. So it was a very detailed census. So that makes it real clear that the Israelites were living in the land of, of Carthage and Sidon and, and Tyre. Now, we talked about the Rock of Gibraltar, and we talked about briefly that the, the uh, country of Spain wasn't called Spain. It was called Iberia. Iberia was the name given to it by the Greeks. It came from the word, you know, Eber. Uh, and that's basically relating back to the Eber, which is mentioned in Genesis 10. Now, the Phoenicians sailed to Tartus, which was a seaport in Spain. And you hear that mentioned a lot. Uh, in scripture, but it's it's also, if you remember the story of Jonah, he sailed from, from I guess, from the shores of Joppa, and he sh sailed to Tartus. And so Tartus was a famous port that a lot of, I guess you would say, a lot of traffic went in and out of that port. Um, if y'all wanted to read where it talks about them going to Tartus, you can read Jonah 1 and verse 3. And it tells you where he went to Tartus. All right, so now we're moving on here. It's, and we want to talk about the tribe of Dan. Judges 5 and verse 7. It basically is saying that Dan remained in his ships. So Dan was a seafaring nation. And it was a seafaring tribe. And we t heard about Dan before. Dan is basically the Danites. And there's a Irish mythology about Dan, and I'm going to read you what Stabo wrote. And it says, Dan was the father of 50 daughters on coming to Argos, took abode in the cities throughout Hellenus, and that's Greece. And he laid down the law that all the people hereafter named 
the Felicians were be named Danites. So there is an association with Dan be, being in ships. They probably were sailing to different areas. They may have gone to America. You had the Carthaginians going to America, and we're going to prove that in the Phoenicians. Okay, and then we want to talk about King David's gold mines found in America. So we're going to read First Chronicles. It says First Chronicles 22, 2, and, and David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons and hews and and wrought stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails of the house of the gate and with joints and brass in abundance without weight. And David said to Solomon, My son is young and tender, and the house that is built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent. So David prepared abundantly for before his death. And verse 10, I'm going to jump to that. He shall build a house for my name, and, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel. Now, that's the Israelites he's talking about forever, because that throne of David, we know, moved to Ireland, then to Scotland, then into Britain. First Chronicles 22, 14, that's telling us that he, he put aside hundred thousand talents of gold and tons of, of silver and tons of brass. So the question is, where did David get all this metal? Now, he couldn't have got it just from the lands that he lived in. And so we want to go back and talk about the archaeology that was done in America around the area of Michigan. Now, in 1953 to 1956, a man named Roy Dyer, who led an expedition to the mines around Lake Superior, his company was called the Michigan Mining and Technology. He conducted this expedition, and he found that they had taken out of the mines up to 50 million pounds of copper, 50 million pounds was was removed from those mines, and he did the radiocarbon dating on it and found out that it had to occur between 2000 and 1000 B.C. Now, we know David lived at exactly around 1000 B.C., and he reigned for 40 years. So this is the same time frame that this huge amount of, of gold and silver and precious minerals was being taken out of the land. Now, we know that the Bible mentions a place called Ezon Gibber, and it was located actually in the area land of the Phoenicians. There was a strong alliance between King David and King Haram, who was the king of Tyre at that time. And we be believe that they brought the copper back to Egon Gilber and let them manufacture that, those metals there. Um, I think I'm going to read 1 Kings 9, 26, which talks about this. The king Solomon made a navy of ships at Egar Gibber, which is beyond Elon, on the shores of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. And Herod spent, sent in the navy, sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea with the servants of Solomon. Now, and this is verse 9, 28. And they came to Oprah and fetched then gold 420 talents and brought it to the king of Solomon. All right, so what they're telling you here is they basically had ships that sailed out of Egon Gibber and, the, and they sailed to go pick up, uh, it, it said it had shipmen and it had the navy and King Hiram. Now Hiram, like I mentioned before, it was the king of Tyre. Probably was an Edomite. Chances are it, he formed an alliance and he probably had some Israelites and Phoenicians on his ships and they went to a place called Oper, which we're going to talk about where that is next. Now, I'm going to tell you, and this is going to give us a little clue about what was going on at that time. Uh, in 
1872, a slave to Avezi Costa found a tablet, and he found it in Brazil, and it's called the Baraba Tablet. And on it, they cleaned it up and so that they could read the inscription, and the inscription is amazing because it tells the story of how the people from that area, Phoenicia, actually came to, to um, the Americas. So listen to this part. It says, we are Sidon and Canaan. This is, this is exactly what the stone says. From the city of the Myrtle King, we were cast up on this distant shore, a land of mountains. Okay. We sacrificed the youth to our celestial god and goddesses in the 19th year of our mighty king, Aram, and embarked from Ego Gibber into the Red Sea. So this history statement, this tablet is backing up the story that's in the Bible about how the ship sailed out of Ego Gibber and they sailed to the Americas. And that they were under the kingship in the 19th year of King Hera. Now listen to this part. Now you notice that they're Phoenicians because they sacrificed a child before they went. That was how they thought they could please their gods, is by sacrificing a child. Now that also gives you a clue that those were Canaanites, Canaanite people because they... Canaanites were known for sacrificing, so were Parthians, and so were Phoenicians. And it goes on and it says they sailed, voyaged with ten ships, and were at sea together for two years around Africa. Then we, sep we were separated by the hand of Baal, that's their god, and were no longer with our companions. So we have come here, twelve men, three women, into new shore. May the celestial gods and goddesses favor us well. This is amazing because this slate and this stone tells us that that the exact same story the Bible's telling us about Egon Giver, that the ships came out of Egon Giver, and they that, that tells you that what first Kings nine is telling you is actually a fact. Because King Solomon was sending ships out to, to get different minerals and ores, just like they had always done. Now, we go on here, and I'm going to read you parts and pieces of Ezekiel 27, verse 3, and verse 8, and verse 9. Now, listen to this real carefully. And it says, And say to Tyre, O ye who dwell at the entrance to the seas, who are the merchants of the people of many islands and coastlands, the inhabitants of Sidon and Avar were our oar men and skilled wise men. And O Tyre, we were in you, and they were your pilots, the old men of Gibber, and that's the old city in Sidon, and its skills and the wise men in you, Calchers. All the ships of the sea with your merchants were in you to deal with your merchandise and trading. So what uh, Ezekiel is saying is that the people of Tyre and Sidon were sailors and they would sail out and they would buy merchandise and they would trade. So it's telling you the story. Now it goes on here and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible here. Your rowers brought you out into the great and deep waters. Now there you go. So the Bible is backing up the story that people from Carthage and Tyre and Sidon and some of the Israelites went to the Americas. It says that they went into great and deep waters. The east wind had broke and wrecked you in the heart of the sea where your wares came forth from the sea and you met the desires and the demands and the necessity of the people. You enrich the kings of the earth with your abundant wealth and your merchandise. So it's telling you the same story, that they went out into great waters. Now, okay, so uh, the golden wedge of Oprah is, I think that's really important. The, if you know about the Incas, there was two major tribes in South America, Mexico. They were the Aztecs and the Incas. 
and the Incas had a legend. And their legend was that there was two children that had came from the sun, and they had a golden wedge. And they traveled through the earth until they, to the wedge dropped out of their hand and went into the earth. And they knew that that was where they were supposed to actually start a building and founding a city. And of course, it's a legend, but it's mentioned in the Bible. Isaiah 13, verse 12, says, Even a man that of the golden wedge of Ophrah. Now, that is the Incas, and that will tell you basically that that was in the area of Peru, because that's where Oprah had to be. It was a major port. So that's another proof that these people were going into a port called Oprah, and Oprah was in Peru because that we've identified by this legend that they had that, that that legend comes from the area of Peru. And I think Costco is the name of the town that the legend is talking about. And you can find that legend in the Epic of the Latin America called the Epic of Latin America, page 25. Now, uh, there was two things that we need to know about the Indians in South America. We know that they were doing human sacrifices. I mean, it's very uh, common knowledge that the Aztecs were doing human sacrifices. Now, they had mixed some of their beliefs, and you actually saw some beliefs that were similar to the Hebrews, but they basically were Phoenicians, and they were people who worship Baal, and they probably called him by a different name at that point in the history, but they also had a tremendous amount of gold. And we know the story about how the people came from Spain and Portugal, and they sailed into Mexico, and they took, it's estimated up to $6 billion worth of gold out of that area. They, they killed the Aztecs, and they killed the Incas. And by the way, these were huge, huge, not just tribes, but nations. They would have probably covered uh, a good part of South America and uh, and Mexico. Uh, so these, these were huge areas. In fact, some of them, it's almost two-thirds the size. That people don't realize it. It was probably two-thirds the size of America. But the reason I think that God allowed them to die is because every society, and you can check history, every society that's ever existed that has done human sacrifices has always has been wiped out. And I believe that that was their fate because they continued to do human sacrifices that, that uh, God allowed them to be wiped out. And that's my opinion. But I, I believe that that's probably the case. And this was the case of the Incas, and this was the case of the Aztecs. They were both doing human sacrifices. We're talking about the Aztecs, and we mentioned how they had this tremendous amount of gold. And that the wedge of Oprah that's mentioned in Isaiah 13, 12 is related to Peru, because that is where that legend came from about the golden wedge. So we feel confident because it's mentioning the gold and that we know that primarily most of the gold was coming out of South America at that point. And it's, it's kind of funny that, that our historians leave all this information out. And, it, and they knew that people were in America. They knew that the people from Carthage and the Phoenicians had come to America and that they were mining. They knew this information because even later in history, they stayed and they become the American Indians. And uh, there's a record in Iceland in the museum of a letter that was sent from the Pope to some priests in Iceland asking them to go to America and see if you can get the people to return back. So they had to know. They, they knew that they were there. And our historians know that information. That's been basically swept under the rug. Now, so how did we get this idea 
that Columbus discovered America. Now, we need to talk about that briefly, and that came from the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian, when they were set up uh, about the 18th century, it was a, a large donation that set up the Smithsonian in America. And they, they were the ones that said Columbus was going to be given the official title of discovering America. Now, I asked you, if they all knew the history and they knew who these people were that came over, and I'm going to prove to you it was the Phoenicians. We hadn't got there yet, but I'm going to prove to you it was the Phoenicians. Well, if they knew that information, then what was the reason for not sharing it? And that was because they do not want people to know that the Bible is correct and that the people that came over were some of the Israelites. And not to mention some of the Phoenicians also. So it ties back to the Bible, and they, they don't want people to know their history, simple, plain, and, and to the point. And the people that would not teach in the universities that Columbus discovered America were, were dismissed from their jobs because it, it was an accepted, established fact that they said, you know, we're going to say that Columbus discovered America, even though they knew. And even when you see these specials on TV, they, they mentioned real briefly about some of the Hebrews may have came over, but they mentioned about how the people uh, came all the way from the South Seas in a canoe and came to America. Really? Do you really think they came in a canoe to America? Really? I, it's it's way beyond reason. Could you come across the Pacific Ocean in a canoe? I don't think so, and neither did these people. Okay, so it, it's time for people to start making some sense about our history and telling it how it is and how it's factual. It, it, they did not come across in a, in a canoe from the South Seas. They may have came across in a canoe, but they went to South America. They didn't come to America, not the, the United States. Now, there is some Indians that came across the Barren Strait from Russia into, into Canada and down. And, but we know that there's very few of those that did that. Because the bloodline testing, again, shows up that they have the physical characteristics of the people in Asia, and there's only one particular tribe that has that, and that's Blackfoot. I think it's, I'm not sure, I think they are located in the Dakota somewhere or in that area. But that was the only tribe that out of all the tribes in America, okay, that tested out to have Asian blood. So there's this story that you see on TV about all these people that come across they come across from Russia into Alaska, down into, into America, and it's just a lie. Because, like I said, we only have evidence of one tribe doing that. Now, the, the, the chain of Indians that are located on the northern part of America, they're called the Algonians, Algonians, Indians, and they are like a huge confederacy. It has about 20 different kinds of uh, Indian tribes that fall under this category called the Igorians Indians. Well, these particular groups, their original history comes out of the Great Lakes. They came in from the St. Lawrence River and in the Great Lake region. Exactly the same place that the mining was being done around the Lake Superior. So how do we how do we justify and say, uh, in fact, the American Indians resemble the people of the Middle East, not the people of Asia? And that's a known fact. Now I'm going to read you a quote here from the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. The person who's writing this article is Ernest Putin. He is a professor at Harvard University. He says, 
We believe that the Near Easterners may have played a factor in the American Indian racial diversity. Oh, wow. Okay. And this, the, he also, there's also several other people that have written this too, but in the same article they quote, they make another quote that says that these people were bearded figures that look like, more like Near Eastern people than Mongoloid, which means that they're looking more like the people of the Middle East than they are looking like the people of Asia. That's what they know, but we've been told this lie that all these Indians come down through uh, Asia and settled in this area, and it's just not a fact. In fact, uh, black feet that we mentioned, tribe, have a blood type of A, and that matches up with many of the, of the Asians that have the blood type A. But the majority of the people that are Indians in America have blood type O. How do you explain that? Because that is a European bloodline. And they know about those the Indians in, on the northern shore, which we call the Algonians again. Those particular Indians, their language is very closely related to Hebrew. So how does that happen? And I, I tell you how it happens. It's by people that are not telling you the truth. So now we're going to speed up here. We're going to talk a little bit about Carthage. And Carthage got sacked. Now remember, it's a port in the Mediterranean Sea. It got sacked by Rome in 146 B.C. And all the Carthaginian libraries were destroyed, which it was a huge library, which is a real shame because we would have known a lot about our history. So we're talking about the Punic War. That's what they call the war with Rome and Carthage. It was three specific wars, and you know the story. I've covered this before about Hannibal. But when the, the Carthaginians saw that they were going to lose the battle, they fled that area. And the area that they fled to, we believe, was uh, the Ohio Valley in America. And there's a book out called The Voyager to the New World. And it's written by Nigel Davies. And Nigel basically tells you that there was 30,000 men and women in 60 ships that sailed somewhere around the same time frame as the fall of, uh, of Carthage. You know, they could have come as early as, as you know, because this World War went on for a while. Uh, they could have came as early as the 400 B.C., but we're not real sure. Now, Albert Church also who was a famous historian. He wrote, it was decreed by the Carthaginians that Hanno should sail beyond the pillars of Hercules and found cities. Accordingly, he sailed with 60 ships of 50 oars each and a multitude of men and women in the number of 30,000. Now, the historians know about this event, but they say, oh, we don't believe that happened. They know that this has been recorded in history, that the people from the Carthaginians came out of the Mediterranean Sea and went to America. They know it. But they said, oh, we don't think that they had ships that would carry 30,000 people over there. No, you don't think that, but you think that the people get in a canoe and sail from the South Seas to America. In a canoe. You think that. I know the foolishness that they teach. And then none of it is backed up by history. There, there was some tribes, like we mentioned, that did come through the Barren Straits, but for the most part, we know and we feel comfortable saying the people of Carthage came over here to work in the mines, the copper mines, and stayed. That's what actually happened. They settled in with a group of people called the Hopewell people, 
And the, there was two people called the Ardenians and the Hopewell people. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to do more information on, basically, on the Indians. This is not going to be our only program on the Indians. But we want to mention the Hopewell people because that is basically the people that lived in the Ohio Valley. And if I have time, I'm going to cover all the people, all the different archaeological findings that they have found that prove that the people were here. They had stones that had the Ten Commandments written on them. In fact, they have this area called the Greek, the Great Creek Mount State Park in Mountville, West Virginia. In the very beginning, they thought it was a uh, this cemetery was an Indian cemetery. That's what they basically thought. And so, uh, about 150 years ago, somebody went in there and they said, writing on these tombstones, it's not. It's not an Indian language. It's in Punic Iberian language. Now, that is the language that the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians spoke. And it was the language that was in the Mediterranean Sea around 400 B.C. Same language. That's what's on the grave sites when you go there today. You can actually go and see those grave sites. Now, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson both went and visited, it's recorded how they went and visited this grave site. And they scratched their head and they said, this must be the Israelites. And Jefferson wrote a letter to a historian and said, please go investigate and see if you can prove that these were the Israelites that settled in this area. And the letter has been saved. You can actually see the letter on the internet. So they knew that the Israelites were here and that were part of the American Indians. Now, I got to cover another piece of this. I'm going to talk about this from a totally different perspective because not all of the Indians are the Phoenicians. Okay, there's a large portion of them that are. But there is a, a, a very famous historical record the, it's, called, it's in Wells, and it's called the Wells Chronicles, and it's, it's their chronicles, and they wrote about a man named the Mighty Hugh, and how the Mighty Hugh pushed the Canaanites out of the land. He pushed them out of the land, and he pushed them into the northern part. Now, they also call him Jesus. They write it as an H instead of a J, which would make perfect sense because, you know, a lot of languages didn't use the J in their language. So they kept calling this man Jesus. Well, the Welsh Chronicles says that this man named Hugh took a group of people to Britain in the, about before the 11th century, right in the same time frame as Joshua. They were of the descendants of Abraham. And I think that's really interesting because the time frame that they're writing about fits perfectly that time frame of, of Joshua. And, and we know that the word Jesus is the Greek word for the Messiah. We also know that in Hebrew, he's called Joshua or Yahshua. So, the interesting thing is that it's very easy to connect and realize that this mighty Hugh probably was Joshua. He pushed the Canaanites not just out of the land of Canaan, but he pushed them all the way up to the to the northern part of the of the world, and they went into Norway, the top part of Norway, and they become known as the people called the Laps. We have some record of some of the Laps. Uh, the sentence being in America. And I think that's really interesting. And those are, the Laps were Canaanites, and they lived in tents, which is very similar to what that what went on then. Now, there was an area called the Raqqa that Joshua drove the people out of the land of Israel into this area called the Raqqa. And it's with the Therakians. And the history in Ireland, and I want to tell you the quote here, it's called the Book of the 
uh, the conquest of Ireland is in several volumes here, but it talks about how the Thracians were not Israelites, they were not Celtic, they painted their bodies blue, and they tattooed their bodies, and they were driven out of that area eventually, and they came into Scotland as the Picts, and we've heard about the Picts because we know the Romans put the Adrian Wall, when they came into Europe, they put that Adrian Wall in there, and the Scottish people on the other side and the Picts were separated from Roman control, Britain at that time. So they did not want to deal with the Picts. They were scared of them. We know that some of those people also came to America. So there, there's many tribes that came, and we're going to get into more detail and more discussion on this, but I see that we're running really close on time here. Um, also wanted to mention that the Indians tribes, but the Indian tribes in America, kept the Old Testament laws. So how did that happen? So how did they keep the Old Testament laws if they were not Israelites and Israelite-related people, which would have been the Canaanites, the uh, Carthaginians, the people from Tyre, the people from Sedan? It says, like the Jews, the Indians offered their first fruits. They kept the new moons. They kept the feast at the end of September in the beginning of October. They've divided the year in four seasons that corresponding to the Jewish festivals in some part of North America, they circumcise, circumcision is practiced. There is also much etymology between the Hebrews and the Indians in which they consider various rites and customs of purification, uses of baths, fasting, and manners of prayer. The Indians likewise abstain from blood of animals. They also, from the fish without scales, they considered unclean, and certain birds and reptiles were considered unclean. They were accustomed to offer as firstlings of the flock. So now, this is from the Peruvian Antiquities, and it's page 9. That's the name of the book. And it talks about how American Israelites, which was the Indians and the people of Tyre, Sidon, and Phoenician, and Carthage, these people were mixed, a mixed people, and they came to America, and they became the American Indians. And we can tie it back. We know that they came. We have evidence that they came from the Bible. I uh, wanted... a. And we're going to do more information on the Indians, American Indians, because I think it's a fascinating story. And I think we've been told so many stories that are not true. People wonder where their ancestry comes from, and, and the majority of it were uh, people that could have been Israelites. So we're going to call it a night tonight, and we're going to say blessings to all, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.